Hi, I'm Ronnie O'Sullivan. Welcome to my 147 Heaven and Hell. One of his favourite shots. That was just a taste of what's to come. This is all about balls and bottle. Believe me, it takes a lot of balls, 36 and all, and bottle to complete a 147. Snooker is one of the few games in which you can measure perfection. And even pros have been potting for years, still wet their pants at the thought of getting the big max. And this is what this program is all about the beautiful, the flawless, the fabulous 147. We'll also be looking at the sheer hell of near misses including one of mine that cost me a cool 147 grand. And I'll be picking my selection of the 10 greatest players I'd want playing for my life. Here's one of them, my boyhood idol, the one and only Nugget, Steve Davis. And here he is putting together the very first maximum break seen on television. Very similar break to John's first effort in this match. Again, catching the reds a little bit too thickly. Running into the jaws of the corner pocket. And the match at a very interesting stage. Two frames all. Best of nine frames. One. And Steve Davis knocks in the initial red in this frame. Nicely on the black. And quite a few reds split out of the pack already, so chance of a Eight. reasonable start for Steve here. Sixteen. Twenty-four. Steve leaving himself an angle to go into the reds here and open them up. 25. And you can't do much better 32. than that. Four reds, four blacks. A little bit out of position now. Be thinking in terms now of sending that cue ball down to the ball can, I would think. I think there's a red there that he can pot. 22. Oh, well, a very ambitious young man. So a beautiful double there. And then once again, nicely on the right. 33. of angle on this to do almost anything he wants with the cue ball. 
into the reds, open them out as much as possible. 40. Well, there goes the sixth 41. red. Once again on the black. Steve's taken all blacks with the first five reds. Could possibly be thinking of this winning this Larder car with a one four seven break. That's the most dangerous thing, Dennis, to predict. Because usually, as uh, David, I'm terribly, I always get you two tailors mixed up. You find so often that when you make a prediction like that, that the player misses the next shot. <laughs> but not in this instance, and things still looking good. It took Steve eight minutes to compile this century, and here he is, just two reds to go. He'd only just got back from the World Tour the day before. Go on, my son. Piggy's got the angle to get on the black. We'll play a deep screw, I would think. And that's fair enough. 105. What a magnificent break this is. This is very exciting. And there's a confident shot for you. Leaving himself well down the table, but a nice straight red. One of his favourite shots. Stun this in. What a mile. This is it now. Pop this in. Beautiful shot. Beautiful shot. Perfect angle. And the, the atmosphere is absolutely electric in there now. Well, as if this young man hasn't made enough history in the last 12 months. 120. Here again we might see the first legitimate 147 break ever to be made on television. 122. All the colours on the spots. But you can imagine the tension that's building up in young Steve at the moment. 125. Well, well, Steve is he's looking very, very calm. Normally this would be elementary, but under these circumstances, every pot is so difficult. Come on, come on round. 129. Bit, that a bit further. Well, if anybody can knock these three balls in, this man can. Well, of course, that's the great thing about this young fellow, David, is... Nerves of steel, or seems to have. Now, is this Hugo going to get onto the front? No, it isn't. Now, we're going to have to see a super shot here. Well, come on, Steve. Pull, pull a fabulous shot out. I'm sure you can do it. And he's playing this with a lot of screw to stay on the black. Come on, get in. Fabulous shot. <laughs> Fabulous shot. And this is it. The first 147 break on television. 140. Well, I'm shaking. Right, I'll bet Steve this at this moment can see the pocket closing up and closing up and Come getting on, Steve. smaller. Come on, Steve. Yeah. Listen to the audience, he's got a standing ovation for that, and rightly so. Absolutely incredible break. Well, I don't think Steve can believe it himself. He's gone all the way around the world and just come 
home and popped a 147 in like. Is there any problems? Oh. Marvellous. That took a lot of bottle. Imagine the pressure knowing that nobody has ever seen a 147 live on telly before. No wonder Steve was called the Ginger Magician. I'd have given my right arm to have his cue action. Poetry in motion. Next, we've got another incredible maximum. And this is also history making because it was the first in a world championship match. This time, it's the grinder at work, Cliff Auburn. We can't show you every shot or it'll take forever. These are the best bits of a slow but unforgettable break. Cliff was brought to the table by Terry Griffith's foul shot that gifted him four points. Now watch how Cliff then starts his break with a complete fluke. You need luck as well as talent on the way to a 147. It took Cliff around 13 minutes to get down to the final red. Snail pace stuff. The snooker's a game for marathon runners as well as sprinters. Well, that's one way of getting them, I suppose, and staying on the black as well. My word, that's a bonus. Keep rolling. They have actually stopped playing on the other table. Well, now this is the real shot uh, that matters, Jack, to get on the yellow. If he can do that, he could be well on. He hasn't come quite far enough. He's left himself a tough shot, but that's 15 reds and 15 blacks that he's taken now. Well, this is carrying 10,000 pounds for the highest break, 5,000 for a championship break, and 3,000 for the highest break. So we're talking about 18,000 pounds on this. Oh, that was a marvellous yellow that uh, Cliff Thorburn took then. And Bill Werbenick, as tense as he is. Perfect. Well, I don't think there's going to be another moment in Cliff's life when he's going to be so tense as this.
I was eight years of age when I first picked up my first note kit. The circumstances were I was around my uncle's house and he'd bought a table for his, his son and we just started, started from there really. The, uh, you know, the thing of a cue and a ball, hand eye ball, good coordination, it all just seemed to fit into place for me so I found my sport. Snoop's so table would have been around six foot three, which was a standard size for a pool table. A little bit too small for a snooker table, but because I was only small, it seemed quite big anyway. Mm. The sort of breaks I'd be making when I first started playing would have been relatively small. Um, maybe putting two or three balls together, so eight, nine, and uh, but quickly managed to get up to the twenties and thirties brackets, and, and then um, you know the game got more exciting from there. Yeah, the, the sporting background that um, my family um, was involved was boxing at first. Uh, my granddad and his two brothers, known as the Fighting O'Sullivans. Danny was British and European champion and fought for the world title twice. And, that, and, and in fact, he's in the Guinness Book of Records for being knocked down the most times in one fight, which was 14 times. But that was at the end of his career, so good excuse for that. Um, and then the, my, my, my dad, who was a, a king footballer, and his brothers could have, if they'd have been a bit more dedicated, maybe made it as a professional, but they didn't end up doing that. But um, for, for me, obviously, the, sport, the sporting influences continued, and now I'm playing my snooker, and uh, so you never know, one day uh, my son may be a Wimbledon champion. Who knows? My first century break, I, I remember compiling when I was uh, 10 years of age. And uh, I remember being down at the club and I was playing John the Dustman. And it was, uh, I said to him, come, we'll have a quick frame before, uh, before the, the night fly started. I remember it was on a Saturday night. And um, he said, come on so, And I remember potting all these balls and I was thinking, oh. And I got to 100 and I just panicked and I couldn't believe it, you know. Just about to see over the table. So for me to have made a 100 break at 10, that was, that was the most amazing achievement that I can remember achieving. And um, I remember being so excited. And, my dad just brought me back down to earth, you know, I told him, I said, I just made a hundred, and he was like, yeah, so what, you know, and uh, I was like, it's a big deal to me. So far, it's been all about getting balls in the pocket, but when a 147 is on, the pressure suddenly increases and the pockets seem to shrink. Take it from me, there's nothing worse than to be in shooting distance of a 147 heaven and then cock it up. Here's a reminder of some of the most heartbreaking misses in recent snook history. And look who's kicking it off. I'm about to blow a fortune. I was playing Stephen Hendry in the World Championships at the Crucible in 1999. And we pick it up here just as I'm about to complete my century. Years ago. It won't be quicker, but It'll be just as warmly received. 105. The maximum looks almost in the bag, or should I say the pocket? Uh, the crowd are urging the cue ball forward. 112. 147,000 pounds for a maximum. And it's within his grasp now. 120. 122. 125. Not just a marvellous break, but a marvellous one in context, having just sat out two centuries. 129. Stephen Hendry will be the first one to congratulate him. One hundred and thirty-four. This is not straightforward. Come on, Ronnie. No, no. Oh, oh, no. Oh, it's one hundred and thirty-seven thousand pounds slips away. But a terrific effort of one hundred and thirty-four. Just overcut it. What a wally. It's the sort of shot I can usually put away with my eyes closed. It cost me a little matter of 147,000 smackers. We now see Ken Dockey. 
Well, I've been playing since I was a kid of 13, suffering the great 147 jitters. He needs to sing the six colours in his Benson Edges final against Matthew Stevens in 2000. Be warned, it's not a pretty sight. <laughs> He's never had a 147 in competitive play. I think the green might just sneak past the brown, but it's tight, obviously. few maximums but this is one of the most exciting well Matthew's praying that these two colors go in Fantastic. £19,000 high break prize almost certainly but the honour of getting a first 147 at such a vital time, that's eluded him It gets worse Ken Dockett was just a spectator as his opponent Stuart Bingham went through the maximum misery during the World Championship at the Crucible in 2002 What a chance now Cliff Thorburn has made one here. So have Stephen Hendry, Jimmy White. Thank you. And Ronnie O'Sullivan. This sort of stuff should carry a government health warning. He'll be, he'll be shaking inside. <laughs> 15 reds, 15 blacks. And perfect on the yellow. 120. Once again, he's having the white cleaned. He's not rushing things. This is incredible. Just the last four colours for a maximum and £167,000. Which would double his career prize money. It really is incredible. He's had the white cleaned on at least five occasions to settle himself down. Come on, Stuart. Go on, White. Oh, he's a bit short. He might have to go all the way around the table. What a shot he's Thank faced you. with. Another two or three inches, and it was a formality. Oh. What a 
shame. Still Bingham, 144. No, 167,000 pounds, no maximum. But a great effort. He'll remember that for the rest of his life. A 147 calls upon all these 15 minutes, then followed by a black each time, then onto the colours. Yes, a load of balls. Here's another Canadian, Herb Stevens, do it in style with the well with Jimmy White. been set an example by the senior Canadian player. I wonder if the junior one can emulate the master. Hundred and twelve. Kirk was down to his last red in just over eight minutes. Love the Fred's Kirk. I'll have a cornet please. And he's perfect. He is perfect. Eleven thirteen. Well, tremendous applause from the audience, and if, with the best wish in the world, if only they would just give him a little bit of a hush now. Yes, he didn't intend to uh, make contact with the pink there. And uh, he's got now a tricky shot with the rest. I think the angle's uh, OK, Rex. I think a main problem here is just that he's got to use the rest. And there's no alternative. Well, not quite far enough. 122. So this demands a really good shot. Yes, he's got to uh, pot the green this time, I think, and go all the way around the table. So uh, the angle is there, but he'll need just a little bit of luck to get onto the brown to enable him to get back on the blue. <laughs> just look at this. Stop. And it has. It is almost perfect. And just look at the audience. They're enraptured with this. 125. And young Kirk will need nerves of steel now. Not quite right on the blue. I go far enough from the blue, and now this is uh, a big shot that's coming up. And he would have liked to just come another couple of inches to make it easier to cue that. Oh, yeah. uh, now watch the white. This is where he wants a little bounce off the cushion. Well, they're cheering, but it isn't there yet. And a little pause, composure. 140. Get in! Lovely! Super! Ah, <laughs> oh, that's 
really wonderful. Just look at that. Good heavens above, Rex. Isn't that marvellous? That was fantastic. A wonderful break, Jack. Really magnificent. I'm so pleased for Kirk Stevens. Fortunate, really, because it never seemed like a chore to me to practice. Some some people would say, you know, I'm going to play you know, for three or four hours a day. Whereas sometimes I come in the club and think, you know, I get in at ten o'clock and uh, say I finish by four or five o'clock because there was something I, I maybe had to do in the evening. But then sometimes that would just roll into like me being at the club still at midnight and playing wherever there was at the club, just because you know my love for the game was just so, so strong. And uh, so it was never a chore for me to practice. So I could practice from anywhere from three or four hours up until. Nine, ten hours a day. Uh, you know, that's 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 how much I I love the game, and uh, it was just you had to f scrape me off the table, really. When I'm actually playing in tournaments, um, the amount of time to practice is is rescheduled a little bit. Um, would wouldn't play nearly as much as I would do if there was no no tournaments. Being the way that you'd want to stay fresh and and on the ball, and, and, and you don't really want to leave your best snooker on a practice table. That's a, that's a big danger that you can do, is maybe overdo it sometimes. But seeing when, when there's the tournaments, that is, that is uh, it mentally it takes a little bit out of you as well, so you, you like to keep yourself nice and fresh and, and well attuned to, to the challenges that you, you will get by you know, playing in competitive games. I remember my first victory as a professional very, very well. I remember being in uh, the Norbert Castle in Blackpool, which was a big hotel out there where all the qualifying stages for all the professional games were taking place and I remember um, having a player fellow called Jason Smith and knowing that he was a good player, I played him on the amateur circuit but going into a new territory which is professional which, and obviously wanted to, to prove myself as a professional I was very nervous uh, and I, I remember winning that game 5-2 and that was a sort of uh, the launch pad really for me to, to go on and, and get the continued success that I did manage to get in my first season as a professional but I really do remember that game really well, you know, because there was a lot of hype, a lot of pressure and, and a lot of expe expectations around me to do well. And uh, the last thing I wanted to do was make a fool of myself and get beat and uh, so everybody could start laughing at me. So, and there was a lot of people there waiting for me to slip up and uh, thankfully I managed to come through that and, uh, and then continue to play you know, pretty good stuff all the way through and, and do myself justice. So I remember it very, very well and uh, it just seems a long, long time ago now. <laughs> This is the hardest thing about our game. Sitting and waiting, watching your opponent at the table, pocketing balls left, right and centre. Jimmy White, probably the most gifted player never to have won the World Championships, had to sit out and watch his buddy Kirk Stevens make a maximum. But more often than not, it was Jimmy White who was in action while his opponents had to sit out and risk a numb bum. Here he is on the way to a whirlwind 147 against another guy who's no slouch, Tony Dodego. Took a bit of a flyer at that one. Twenty-four. Twenty-five. Thirty. 
32. Well, I suppose he could go into the reds this time, but there's a couple of loose reds out there and an angle to get on them. Either of them. But going into the pack really gives Jimmy an opportunity of making a big break. Reds split very nicely. Yes, and I think the fact that he did go into the back. 41. This is all reds, all blacks so far. Doesn't look too happy. Might have just run a little bit too far. He might be able to bend it with a little bit of side. She's done. So, I don't think Jimmy at the moment has got anything in his sights for the maximum. Needs an angle desperately on this red, and I think he's got it. One hundred and thirteen. Perfect. Well, Jimmy White said he was in the best form for a long, long Shut while up. coming here. One hundred and twenty-five. Only Cliff Thorburn has made this break once before at the Crucible. One hundred and twenty-nine. Well. It's getting to me as well, but it's not too bad. He's left-handed, just stun the blue in and leave yourself just a pink to roll in, although nothing's easy now. 134. 100,000 pound for Jimmy White if he can knock the pink and black in. Magnificent Jimmy White creates history at the Crucible Theatre. A magnificent 147. Tony Drago hugs him. The frame score doesn't really matter, but it's Jimmy White who takes the frame before the mid set. Now, Jimmy is a spectator as he watches one of the all time greats, Stephen Hendry, on his way to a 147. Stephen and I have had our ups and downs, but we have a mutual respect for each other when it comes to snooker. Under pressure, there is no better player than Stephen, and here he is, at his best. Well, that isn't the best of breaks from Jimmy, and I'm certain Stephen will take this on. And go all out, all for the black. One. 100. Into the reds now. Nine. 
16. Seventeen. Well, another great shot, 24. splitting the pack, knowing he would have this red to the right corner. to his hundred in just under seven minutes and he had two awkward reds between him and the magical 147. Now these next two shots are the crucial ones. I certainly get on the back here but it's been able to get on that red down near the ball can in a, such a way that he can get back here for the black. So this could be the shot of the tournament. I think he's got a little straighter on the black than he would have liked. He's got a chance. Well, I certainly fancy him now to get the blank. But the unfortunate part is he's put the pink and blue in an awkward situation. So he'll be off the side cushion, right hand side. Come for the black into the right corner. So now it seems just the blue and pink is the only problem. But I promise you, these next six parts, there's more pressure and it will build and build with each shot he takes. Well, that's the worst shot he's played throughout the break. Didn't really get high enough. He could try and split them, but he's such a good long potter. I think it'll be a long blue into one of the corner pockets. Needed to run a little. So now blue into the yellow pocket. And if he gets this, he will be pushing the pink towards the centre pocket. Well, the blue's there. Great chance now. Yes, and listen for the roar of this pink and black goes in. Well, this would be a pressure shot to win a frame, but for a 147, I promise you, the pressure has got to be the greatest ever.
24-7 maximum in crucible history and takes a bonus of £147,000. The inspiration that my dad and, and, and the importance that he's had in my life, you know, has, um, has been key really. I think ever since I was a young kid, I had the tendencies to sometimes, um, you know, want, want to go out and play football or go and, go and play on my bike and, and, and neglect maybe playing snooker and just playing for the fun of it. But my father, obviously, where he had his experience of being a footballer, never actually made a grade, knew the pitfalls that were there and, and um, probably wanted to steer me in the right direction and, and give me all the, the, the good encouragement he could give me. And I remember him being very firm but fair with me and, and saying that, you know, if you, if you want to be the best, these are the type of things that you, you'll probably need to do if you want to be the best. He said, that's if you want it. And uh, I said, yeah, I do want it. You know, he said, so, so as soon as I said I wanted it, you know, the, 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 the rules were rewritten and, um, and basically I had to be in bed early, um, up running in the morning and, and down the club practicing for four or five hours a day and not to, and not to be sitting at the club playing cards like most of the other kids were. So ever since I was a young age, it was installed in me to be, you know, a professional, and ever since the age of 10 or 11, that, that was the way I behaved, really, and uh, it held me in good stead. So, as far as I'm concerned, uh, none of it would have been possible without the advice of my father because, you know, the chances were I could have ended up um, like a lot of the other talented snoop players that were around, you know, down the park, down the bars, having a few drinks, and not really taking it as seriously as maybe I should have done. So, um, yeah, I'm grateful for that um, advice from my father, yeah. I've been lucky enough to have twice shot 147 in the World Championships at the Crucible and I'm proud that they're the fastest on record. I'll just concentrate on doing what comes naturally and I promise you there's nothing better than a 147. Here's my world record break, just 5 minutes and 20 seconds. Enjoy. Nine. Yes, it was just a, a much too thin a safety 16. shot that Mick Price played to leave these on for Ronnie. Seventy. Twenty-four. Twenty-five. Thirty-two. Thirty-three. Well, that's the fifth red and the fifth black coming up. Obviously, the red at the bottom of the cluster will pot. Forty. Forty-one. Now. Forty-eight. Important now off this red to leave a nice angle on the black. Forty-nine. Well, I think he's overdone that slightly, has he? Or can he force the cue ball into that cluster? He can. 56. Just wondering if he can get that one into the left centre. Looks as if he can. 57. <laughs> this is amazing. 64. Sixty-five. Well, Seventy-two. One more red in the frame safe, but Ronnie's got other things in his mind, and so has everybody in the audience. 
Well, listen, John, I know you've commentated on a maximum before. I have never, Eight. and I'm starting to get a bit uh, excited here. There's a little Eight. matter of £147,000 on offer this year for a maximum break. Eighty-nine. Yes, and I think those two reds below the, the pink, one of them will pot in the left corner. Yeah. Well, they will now. <laughs> Needs to be a bit lucky. That's OK. 96. Great chance. Ninety-seven. Four five. minutes for the century. Amazing. Right, this is the key shot. Needs a good angle on this red to get on the black. He's got it just. 113. 122 125 129 Perfect. Yes, absolutely perfect. 134 I don't believe this. Maximum break that is. Ronnie O'Sullivan's delighted. The crowd's delighted. John Virgo and I'm delighted. Five minutes for one unbelievable maximum break. The players are over from the other side of the screen. Sensational. has just gone berserk here. John, I've never seen anything like that. Five minutes for a maximum. Well, the, the great thing about Ronnie O'Sullivan, and of all the 147s I've seen, and, 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 and I have seen a few as we've done, and we've seen three here at the Crucible, but the speed in which he plays, that's what gets people on the edge of the seats. Yeah, it can be quite difficult to motivate myself, you know, and then sometimes I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I've won a couple of world titles, 30 major tournaments, been number one in the world, and, and where could you possibly go from there? And, and there probably isn't many places that you can, can go from there. And, and, I, and the only way I can sort of challenge myself is just to see how, you know, how good I can possibly get as a, as a human being. And, um, and hopefully that feel through for my snooker and, and, and set some records, you know, I'd like to set records in snooker that haven't been set already, you know, uh, Stephen Hendry's world title, number of wins is seven, the possibility of getting eight is, is probably, um, you know, a, a bit unrealistic, but maybe setting unrealistic goals will give me that, that challenge to keep motivated. Um, but, you know, I might just my love for the game, you know, and maybe one day to win a tournament left-handed, who knows, you know, it could get to the stage where I might not want to play, but that, that presents itself a new, a new challenge and uh, something that probably no one has ever done and probably will never ever do because it is a bit, bit freaky really being able to play equally well with left hand right hand but it would need a little bit of uh, tuning in and, and that's something that would probably give me a bit of a challenge uh, sometime in the future that might be um, if I do if the, if the light does start to fade out just to reignite it again would you know maybe swap to my left hand and then um, hopefully win a major title that'd be quite exciting <laughs> There were ten players from all time to pick to play for my life. I would probably pick them in reverse order. I would start with Jimmy White, 
Jimmy White being the most naturally talented player probably to ever pick up a cue and when he's on form, no matter who's sitting in the other chair, you can't stop him playing, he's, he's just poetry in motion. At number nine, I've picked John Parrott, um, reasoning being that I played with him when we won the Nations Cup. Uh, he was playing for England and he was captain of the team and he just seemed to be right to the big match occasion. So as far as pressure situations and if I had to bat someone to, to win a final frame, John Parrott would be well up there and uh, you know he's a, he's a big time player. Number eight, my picking would be John Spencer. Um, managed to win the world title on two or three occasions. Fantastic player, great cue ball control, great cue power, um, and loved the big occasion. So, yeah, John Spencer would get my vote as being number eight. So, uh, yeah. Number seven would be Mark Williams. His single ball potting, his, um, his match play, uh, you know, and he's the sort of person that if your life depended on it, you um, It'd be a good one to have in your corner, and he's, he's very dependable, very strong, um, and, and, and very decent under pressure. So, Mark Williams gets my vote at number seven. Number six um, would be John Higgins. For me, he's, uh, he's depth of all round knowledge of round the table, safety, pot, and break building. He's, he's well above average in, in every department, and when you've got someone that's as strong as he is in every department, he, he then becomes a tough nut to crack. So. My, my vote at number six would be John Higgins, and, and plus him being Scottish, they have that eye to tie, they, they never like losing, so he's a tough competitor. My number five would be uh, Alex Higgins. For me, his uh, natural talent, his ring craft, his, um, his experience of playing on the big occasion, he's proved it time and time again, the most naturally talented player that's ever picked up the cue, and he is a magician. Number four on my list would be Joe Davis, managing to win the t uh, title on no less than 20 occasions. Uh, vast experience, the first man to ever make a 147 in competitive play. Uh, compared him to Steve Davis years ago, it's very hard to make the similarities from, from one generation to the next, but you know, uh, Joe Davis you know, w would be up there with, uh, as one of my highest ranked, ranked ones, and uh, I'll put him in at number four. Number three would be Ray Reardon. There's one player, you know, um, that I would dread playing. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's all round game, break building, potting, um, safety, ring craft. Um, you know, he managed to win the world title on no less than six occasions in the modern era. Um, you know, and having worked with Ray, knowing uh, how, he, how he works, you know, um, he's, a, he's a fierce competitor and somebody that you wouldn't want to be playing for every day of your life. Um, he's a top man. Number two, well, I'd go for Steve Davis, um, probably one of the greatest players that's ever picked up a cue. Took the game from one level to another level, um, made everyone relook. You know, there was even players that drew Steve Davis when they knew they had to play in their book out of their hotel at mornings just because they knew they were going to get beat. That was how dominant Steve Davis was in the 80s, and uh, he managed to carry it on through to you know the mid 1990s. So his consistency and you know, his hunger for the game and, and the titles that he won just it speaks all for itself. So Steve Davis gets my vote at number two. And my number one choice um, for being the greatest player of all time and something that played for my life would be Stephen Hendry. Um, played him on many occasions, uh, had some great battles with him and he's the sort of player that um, when his back's against the wall he comes out fighting even more determined and you know, he, he'll never lay down and uh, he's all round game, he's break building. You know, like that Davis dominated in the 80s and 90s, it, it, he would have carried on dominating if it wasn't for Stephen Hendry because he'd come along and just sort of like took the game to a new level and I don't think people realise uh, how to deal with someone like that and it took another 10, 12 years of all the younger generation to, to have watched Stephen Hendry to realise that that's how they needed to play the game, to, to, to compete in the modern day and that's um, Stephen Hendry had a massive influence on the way the game is played today and still plays it to probably the highest level out of anyone, you know, there's probably only two or three of us that can match him. Hope you've enjoyed this visit to 147 Heaven. I'll leave you with a few laughs. Hey. Oh dear. Well, that has to be the, the pot of the century. <laughs> well, what a character. Oh dear, you me. <laughs> Poor Joe.
Is that close? Is it close? Oh, dearie me. Poor Joe Johnson. That must really hurt. And Bill turns and apologises. Thank you for joining me in my 147 heaven. Here's wishing you lots of happy breaks. Thanks for your company. Bye. Jimmy White creates history.